All right. So now we are going to be talking about uh, community structure and dynamics. This is part three. It's the last part of our ecology lecture. And so we are going to be uh, talking about community. So just as a quick review, remember a community is made up of individual populations that are all living close uh, of individuals that are all living close together and interacting or have the potential to interact together. So community ecology is concerned with the factors that influence the composition of the species within a community and the factors that affect the dynamics of those uh, communities. So within those communities, we can have what are referred to as interspecific interaction. These are relationships with individuals of other species in a community. So for example, the interaction between squirrels and black bears or the interaction between crocodiles and uh, fish. Um, these will greatly affect population structure and the dynamics of those structures. So some examples of interspecific um, interactions are listed there. We're going to go through each one of them. Notice that I also have the effects listed for each species as negatives or positives. Either they both are harmed or they both benefit or one benefits and one is harmed. So those are what, well, these inter specific interactions that we're referring to are also referred to as symbiotic relationships or relationships that organisms have with one another. So this interspecific competition occurs when populations of two different species compete for the same limited resource. And we can have what is referred to as mutualism, in which this would be a plus-plus relationship in which both populations benefit. We can have predation, where one species, a predator, for example, kills and eats another. So obviously that's a plus-negative relationship. We can talk about herbivory, in which we have also a plus a negative relationship, in which an animal is eating the parts of or an entire plant. And then there's parasitism, which is also a plus minus, in which the host is being harmed by the parasite or being victimized by that parasite or maybe a pathogen like a virus or a bacteria. Now, an ecological niche is the sum of an organism's use of biotic and abiotic resources in an environment. And this interspecific uh, competition occurs when the niches of these two populations overlap one another and both populations need a resource that happens to be in short supply. What is that going to cause? That's going to cause competition. And this competition is going to lower the carrying capacity for these two populations because they're competing for the same resources um, that are maybe used by one population and as a result are unavailable to another population. So the first one, mutualism. Um, an example of this is those reef building corals and then their relationship with the photosynthetic adenoflagellates. These dinoflagellates are able to secure a shelter that protects them from being eaten by fish, for example, or crustaceans, and it provides them access still to light so that they can photosynthesize. Because remember, these dinoflagellates, these are the ones that were responsible for that red tide. These are those protists that are plant-like, so they are photosynthesizing. Uh, unicellular organisms, and they are also able to use the waste products from the coral, and including carbon dioxide and ammonia, and use those at uh, those products to create or produce proteins that they need in order to maintain their metabolism. So, in predation, this is a positive negative. This is when the predator benefits, but the prey is killed. Um, many prey oftentimes have adaptations that help them to avoid being attacked or eaten by a predator. Um, we see, hopefully you see that frog there that's um, hiding or camouflage on the bark of that tree. We have another um, butterfly here 
that is resembling the monarch butterfly, um, which the monarch butterfly happens to be um, poisonous. The butterfly that is mimicking it is not poisonous, but because it mimics the poisonous monarch butterfly, it is able to avoid being eaten. So some of the other things that organisms can do is they have some mechanical defenses. They might have spines. Um, they might have chemical defenses like certain toxins that um, just don't taste good and so um, predators avoid them. Here's an example of some of those spines, for example, that might be a defense. Herbivory is when we have a herbivore. Um, those are going to be what we're going to call in just a little bit our primary consumers that are eating a plant, either the whole plant or a part of the plant. And these plants then have to expend some energy to replace their lost parts. So consequently, um, many of these plants have numerous defenses against the herbivores, um, bad taste, um, these spines or thorns. And, uh, oh, excuse me, and uh, basically avoid being eaten. So what kind of relationship is that? That is a plus negative relationship, right? All right, so um, toxins in plants tend to be distasteful. So um, herbivores avoid them. I think I mentioned in an earlier lecture that these plants can actually communicate with each other as well. So for example, if you have a plant in an area, they oftentimes will not expend the energy to produce the toxin all the time. But what will happen sometimes is maybe a deer comes along and starts taking a bite out of a plant to see if it tastes good. And they go, oh, this tastes pretty good. And so what they end up doing is they end up communicating to the other members in their population that this particular plant tastes really good. And so he brings all his buddies over and they start munching on this plant. But what they didn't realize is that the first guy when he was munching on the plants actually triggered a hormonal uh, response. So some kind of cell uh, communication to occur in the plant in which now that plant actually sent a signal down through its root systems and out to other plants in that area that says we're being attacked and start producing a toxin so this poor guy he brings all his buddies along they take a bite and they go bah, that tastes terrible what are you talking about and he goes well it tasted good yesterday and anyway that would be a type of communication that can occur between plants uh, some plants produce chemicals that cause abnormal development to occur in insects that eat them so for example some of those caterpillars as they crawl along the leaves and they're eating the leaves, some of these leaves will produce a toxin so that when that caterpillar metamorphosizes into a butterfly, it either won't complete the metamorphosis, um, which is required for reproduction, or it will kill that caterpillar right from the start. Some herbivore plant interactions uh, illustrate what is referred to as co-evolution. So these are also what are referred to as reciprocal evolutionary adaptations of two species. So for example, if we look at the hooked bill of this bird, it just so happens that it fits directly into um, this uh, flower's petals so that it is able to retrieve the nectar from this plant. And as a result, it will also you know, kind of knock the pollen off here and help with fertilizing that plant. And uh, obviously, if this guy had a straight bill, he would not be able to obtain the nectar from that particular flower. Here's um, some other examples of some plants or animals, I should say, that have evolved characteristics, either one of them, to avoid being eaten. So, for example, um, sometimes what happens is there will be um, decoy eggs that this plant really hasn't produced eggs, but what it has is it has spots on it that have co-evolved to resemble these eggs, which then um, protects these eggs because what ends up happening is this plant produces a toxin that tastes terrible. And when somebody's trying to eat this, it tastes awful. They spit it out. They don't eat it. So now this caterpillar can come along, lay its eggs, and nobody wants to eat it because they think it's going to taste awful. So what about a parasite? There's another 
plus negative relationship. So it is living on or in a host for which it is obtaining its nutrients. Um, some internal uh, parasites we've talked about are those randworms, those nematodes, and we've talked about tapeworms. Um, some external parasites that we've talked about, those mosquitoes, it could be ticks, um, it could be some aphids that are all over the outside of your uh, rose bushes, for example. Plants are oftentimes attacked by these parasites, including these aphids, and basically what they do is the plants, they have this tube um, that, remember we've talked about a tube that plants have that carry water called the xylem. Well, right next to the xylem, they have other tubes called phloems, which carry the food um, for the plant, and uh, which would be the sap up to the shoots as well. And these aphids and um, uh, ants, for example, they can actually burrow right into those phloem tubes and they suck the nectar out and basically end up killing the plant because the plant's not getting the nutrients that it needs, um, but the aphid's getting everything that it needs so it can reproduce and create larger colonies. Uh, pathogens, these would also be positive negative relationships in which the pathogen is benefiting and the tree or the plant or the bush is not. Disease causing microscopic parasites can include bacteria, viruses, it can include fungi, it can, can include some of those protists, some of those molds. Non-native pathogens can have very rapid and dramatic effects. For example, the American chestnut tree was devastated by the chestnut blight, which was caused by a protist. And basically what it did is it destroyed the bark of the tree and then it tapped into those phloem tubes and, um, and basically took all those nutrients and um, made them unavailable to the tree. Um, we can have fungus-like uh, pathogens as well. This is what's causing sudden oak death on our coast and uh, is causing some serious harm to plants. It's pretty interesting. When I was in South Dakota, I actually got really lucky and uh, got a helicopter ride over Crazy Horse and uh, Mount Rushmore. But as part of that, we flew over all of these uh, chestnut groves and all of these chestnuts chestnut groves have been attacked by this protist and all of the leaves on the tree, it's the middle of summer, and they are all yellow and dropping off the trees, the trees just look dead. And it was just like tree after tree after tree after tree. It was really, really sad. Okay, so I've mentioned a couple times about trophic structure and trophic levels. And these trophic structures are just a pattern of feeding relationships that consist of several different levels. And the sequence of food tra transfer up trophic levels is known of as a food chain. Most of you have had biology and you're familiar with these food chains. And we know that producers are at the bottom of the food chain. We know that these producers are getting their energy from the sun. We know that that energy flow is in one direction and one direction only. So these arrows represent the flow of energy as it moves from the sun to the plants, to the primary consumers, to the secondary consumers who are eating the primary consumers, to the tertiary consumers who are eating the secondary consumers, to the quaternary consumers eating the tertiary consumers, and that energy may flow to the decomposers, which are made up of the animals that have died and their waste material. And remember, they're going to break down and produce nutrients in their own separate cycle, which provide nutrients for the plants to grow and develop, okay? So the transfer of food is basically moving chemical energy from the producers up through the various trophic levels, which those trophic levels, again, will be labeled as the producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, and it could quite possibly go to the quaternary consumers or the fourth level of consumers. Uh, the fungi and the protists, they would be referred to, and sometimes bacteria, would be referred to as the decomposers. They are breaking down the dead organic material and making that as basically a fertilizer um, that the plants can use to grow. Okay, so here is a trophic pyramid. Here's our producers and our consumer levels. Um, 
Producers, of course, these are the autotrophs. These are using photosynthesis, so they're using sunlight to produce the energy um, that they need for their metabolism and for other organisms. Now, primary consumers, these are all herbivores. Everybody at the primary level are plant eaters. Uh, secondary consumers can eat primary consumers. Secondary consumers could eat producers, so they could eat from either level. Same thing with tertiary consumers. They could eat secondary, they could eat primary, they can eat the producers, okay? So this pyramid, again, we're looking at energy. These uh, producers have the um, most amount of energy. The tertiary consumers are going to have the least amount of energy. And we can also look at this in terms of population. There are way more um, producers um, in any given area than there will be tertiary consumers. Um, think of tertiary consumers, for example, like as a bear. So if we look at a one acre forest, how many producers are there compared to how many bears are living in that one acre forest, okay? All right, so the detritivores. The detritivores are actually specific types of decomposers that are obtaining their energy from what is called detritus. And detritus is oftentimes the leaf litter or the stuff that is dead and dying and decaying that um, was produced by the organisms that are at these various uh, trophic levels. So the decomposers are primarily made up of the bacteria and the fungi and these decomposers, their, their job is to basically digest and break apart the organic material and convert them into or, inorganic forms that are um, doing something called decomposition. If we look at this picture here, this helps explain it a little bit more. Detritivores, these are like the fungi. And these fungi, they absorb their nutrients. They don't photosynthesize, they don't eat. They get their nutrients by absorption. So they're absorbing the dead organic material, that leaf litter that's come down and uh, using that for their energy source. The decomposers are actually breaking down that dead organic material and making or decomposing that material into an inorganic form, that carbon, that oxygen, that hydrogen and nitrogen that plants need, for example, to make the proteins, the DNA uh, material that they need in order to grow and uh, develop. All right, so this is looking at two different food chains. Again, the arrows represent the flow of energy. So a killer whale gets its energy from its tuna, tuna gets its energy from the herring, the herring gets its energy from the zooplankton, the zooplankton gets its energy from the phytoplankton. And where does the phytoplankton get its energy from? The sun. The sun is the ultimate source of energy in every single food chain, okay? So again, the arrow represents the flow of energy and it tells us who gets their energy from who. All right, so a food web is made up of multiple food chains. So it's a network of interconnecting food chains. A consumer may eat more than one type of producer and several species of primary consumers may eat several species of producers. Some animals weave into the food web at more than one trophic level. So you may find a secondary consumer that is also found at the tertiary level, for example. So let's look at this simple uh, food uh, web, okay? This is a desert food web. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the number of producers at the lowest trophic level. We look at the uh, primary consumers that are eating these producers. And in this case, we have the harvester ants that are eating the plants. We have the kangaroo rats that are eating the plants. We have this antelope squirrel that's eating the plants. Uh, we have a gila woodpecker that's eating the plants and a grasshopper mouse and a grasshopper themselves. These are all what we refer to as primary consumers. So they are all called what? Herbivores, okay? So our next level that we just clicked in, these are our secondary consumers or sometimes our tertiary consumer if they are eating on two levels. So here is our elf owl. It's a secondary consumer because it's eating a grasshopper, which is eating the plants. Our red-tailed hawk, it is eating a mouse, which is eating a plant, which makes it a secondary consumer. However, what if this mouse, I'm sorry, this hawk 
ate a snake that ate a squirrel that ate the, the plant. Then this red-tailed hawk would be what we call at the tertiary level. In this diagram, it's shown at the secondary with the level with the arrows because it is directly eating the squirrel that's eating the plant, or it's directly eating the kangaroo mouse or rat that's eating the plant. But if we went and we took this little snake that it's eating, then it would be at the tertiary level, as we see drawn in purple here. Okay. All right, so species diversity. Um, species richness refers to the number of different species that live in a, com a, a community. Relative re abundance is the proportion of species that are in that particular community. And again, we can go and we can count either visually or we can do a, a capture, mark, a recapture type things to figure out the species richness or the relative abundance. A low species diversity is characteristic of most agricultural ecosystems because we oftentimes remove uh, certain species in that area because maybe we don't want them to crossbreed one type of corn with another type of corn. We just want one well-producing corn that we know and like, or maybe we don't want any insect, uh, corn-eating insects in that area. So we kind of limit species diversity in those areas. This here is an example of species diversity. Uh, we have um, these particular canopy type trees. We have some different types of conifers. We have this uh, tall fern type tree. If we count and uh, keep track of the number of trees in this area, we can count and see over time if there's any change in the diversity of the population of these trees. And we see these fern type trees increase their numbers. We see that these ones with this wide canopy decrease their numbers. But what do we see overall? We see that the diversity of individuals in this population have increased. All right, so this is just looking at the relative abundance of lot A versus lot B. And that's what we were looking at in those pictures is they had lot A and B divided. And these are just the numbers uh, from that that show in this case that in lot B, I mean, lot A, remember we had a lot of these and we had very few of the fern trees. But in lot B over time, we ended up with a pretty much percentage of trees that increased the diversity as each tree reproduced and kind of created the same uh, number or stability within that population. Ooh, keystone species. Keystone species are very cool. They are the species in a population or in a community that is larger than its biomass or abundance, which indicates uh, that it occupies a niche that holds all of the rest of the community in place. And if we were to remove that keystone, everything would fall apart. In fact, uh, some of you might have been to a museum or some kind of hands-on place in which you see this little arch like this and uh, you're supposed to put it together. I've seen it at several different malls in their food court. I know Newport Beach in their little mall, they or Huntington Beach, they have it in their little mall and kids can build this structure out of foam. And, and uh, the only way to hold it together is if they get this keystone um, put in the right place. And if you remove this keystone, the whole thing falls down. So a keystone species has low biomass or low relative abundance. So there's not very many necessarily of it in a population. But if you were to remove that individual from the community, it results in lower species diversity. Okay. There is a film that is available. I really like it, but I'm a biologist. You may find it interesting, um, especially now that you have a little bit of an education in this. I would have said, you know, a week ago, eh, you probably wouldn't find it very interesting. But now you have a little bit more information and knowledge under your belt. And if you were to go watch this film, you would probably be much more interested and you would get a lot more out of it. It is called Serengeti Rules. It's available on uh, Primetime Video. It's available on Netflix. And I put a link to the free, uh, another free version that's on YouTube. So I would say if you have it on Primetime, probably or Netflix, that would probably, you know, 
show better. But if you don't have it, you can go watch it on um, Prime Time, or I'm sorry, uh, YouTube. And uh, one of the, um, it's basically stories about ecology and about species diversity. There's great stories about keystone species. And one of the things they talk about is uh, one of the research uh, professors, they did a study on sea stars and they discovered that sea stars are a keystone species. So what he did was he found tidal pools that had a large diversity or population of species like you see here. And what he did is he went and he threw out all the sea stars. And every day he would visit this pond and he would throw out any sea stars that tried to make their way in. And he kept them out of this community. And what's interesting is when you look at, uh, for this community, for example, you see algae. Uh, these are uh, barnacles here. We have some mussels here. Um, there's some sea anemones that are buried down in here. And um, what he found was when he removed the sea stars, this whole population of species that you see in this tidal zone changed and changed very dramatically. What happened is, is these sea stars, they eat these mussels and they keep the population of these mussels in check. And when you remove these keystone species, what happened is all the barnacles died, all the sea anemones died, all the algae disappeared, and all that happened was all of these mussels overtook the whole area. And then what happened is they reached carrying capacity. What happened when they reached carrying capacity? Their population numbers went down because now in that particular tide pool, they didn't have enough resources to support their entire population of mussels. And uh, so you saw this huge change. Then he wanted to say, okay, what would happen if we introduce the sea stars back into that population? So he put sea stars back in and lo and behold, guess what? That population now returned back to I mean, we could say normal, returned back in which there was a larger diversity of species in that area. And now all of the populations um, were able to maintain at carrying capacity. All right, so this is just kind of looking at his data from that experiment. Um, so this is with the disaster, which is the type of sea star in that area. And you can see that uh, species diversity, there were like what, about 18 to 20 different species present in that particular tide pool. And when he removed the sea star, look at what happened very dramatically. I mean, that's over like a two year, two, three year period of time, the species diversity rapidly decreased into where there wasn't much diversity in that population. Um, at all, and that population wasn't doing very well. And there's a nice big disaster. And if you look closely here, you got those barnacles again. You've got some of you visit tide pools, so I'm kind of trying to help you out here. These right here, they look like um, spongy gel type things. These are actually sea anemones. When they draw, when they uh, the water goes out, they take their tentacles and they bring them inside, and so it looks like just like this spongy blob sitting on rocks because they're trying to keep whatever moisture they have inside of their body until the tides come back out. And then these right here, they look like rocks in this picture, but these are actually all mussels, and you can see some of those barnacles are all on top of those mussels. The sea star. Um, I didn't really talk about it when we talked about sea star, but all of these little white things that you see are actually called pedicillariae, and they're like little pinchers. And uh, they can, it's really interesting if you get, ever get a chance, you can actually feed sea stars if you're in a tidal pool. You can get some algae, and you can just take some algae and you can kind of tickle these pedicillariae, and these little uh, pinchers will grab onto it. And what they'll do is they'll actually move that algae 
um, down to their tube feet and they'll move that algae to their mouth. And their mouth, remember, is on the underside of their body here. And uh, you can actually watch sea stars eat. I think it's really neat to see it in an aquarium because sometimes the sea stars are on the glass and you feed them the little algae and they'll take it and manipulate it all the way around their mouthpiece. And you, because they're on glass, you can see them eating um, between them and the glass. All right, so hit that mouse again. Disturbances then, events that damage biological communities, storms, fires, flood, drought, and human activity, like removing all the sea stars, these can disrupt entire communities. Uh, small scale disturbances oftentimes have a positive effect, but those large scale disturbances have oftentimes very severe effects. Think about like the tsunami that came through and wiped out um, a large population of organisms on Japan. Um, what happened was that total, that community in that area totally and drastically changed. All right, and when a environment changes like that, it can lead to something that is called ecological succession. And this is what we refer to as a transition in species composition of a community. So for example, when a, the tsunami came along and it hit Japan and it wiped out a huge part of the island, all of those species were, were killed. And um, at the same time, the topography of the land changed and it opened up all kinds of new niches for other organisms to now move into and colonize that area. And that's what it didn't happen, is you end up with um, birds flying over the area. And when they poop, they deposit seeds. And then that grows into a plant. And um, with the plants, in comes the insects. And when the insects come in, the larger animals come in. When the larger animals come in, even larger animals can come in. And then eventually over time, what happens is the, the, the small plants grow bigger and then those ones grow bigger and then pretty soon you have trees coming back. This is what we refer to as secondary succession. This is succession that occurs after disturbance has destroyed a community, but has managed to leave the soil intact. Um, many of us, because we are we live up here in the high desert, are familiar with a couple years ago, we had the Blue Cut Fire come through uh, the Cone Pass and on up the 138 and uh, wiped out a huge population of um, um, animals and plants. And now we're looking at this like two and a half, almost three years later now. And when you're driving down 138, you don't really see any evidence of the fire unless you get out and you hike and you look down, you know, at where some of the old growth was. You'll see some of the burned uh, trees and yucca and all that kind of good stuff. But just driving down 138, if you didn't know there was a fire there, you probably wouldn't know that there was a fire there because of succession. Now, in succession, what happens is the littlest plants move in first, and that would be like lichens, um, which when you're hiking or you're walking, you've actually seen lichens, you just didn't know it. They form like a, kind of looks like a mossy layer over the top of rocks. It might be orange, it might be yellow, it might be green. And uh, then the next thing that comes is like small little grasses. Um, you might get some mushrooms. Um, and then the larger plants start coming in, especially as birds are flying or animals are walking through and they're bringing seeds with themselves, okay? Now, primary succession is a little bit different. Um, this occurs on barren rocks or where the soil has been totally destroyed um, in which nothing lived there before. So think um, like in the top picture, um, a volcanic island that's being formed. There was nothing living because it was very hot. It was hot magma that was coming up, being cooled by the oceans. And the only reason those plants are growing there is because you had animals, for example, bringing in seeds and um, some of that magma was breaking down or you had some loose soil somewhere else that blew in and uh, gave these seeds a chance to plant some roots and to grow. And then with the production of these plants, then animals can move in because they have something to eat. Another example of primary succession could be like a glacier. 
Um, so for example, if you have a glacier that melts and soil is now exposed and plants start growing, um, that would be an example of primary succession. So this is primary succession. These are secondary successions. All right, invasive species. Invasive species is something that we really have to pay attention to and uh, understand that these are non-native animals that are being introduced into habitats that can have severe effects on communities by destroying the native communities in that area. Um, this example is huge. This ivy is a non-native plant. It is an invasive plant that uh, once whoever planted it here left it, it took over. It killed everything else. It's covered all of these. It's grown up over the top of all these trees. These trees that are underneath this ivy are dead. Uh, they are just holding the ivy up to the sun so that the ivy can continue reproducing and growing. Uh, you can see it taking over the car. Um, and what it's done is it's run out all of the other plant species in that area. Uh, this uh, boa constrictor here, uh, this python has, um, it's an invasive species. Sometimes what happens is people get these um, snakes as pets and they look so nice and sweet when they're little, uh, not realizing that these guys can grow 15, 20 feet, 35 feet and get to be very big around. Um, I used to have a 15 foot Burmese python. It started out at nine feet and then within 10 year period of time, it grew to 15 feet and started to get kind of scary because I had a huge uh, wooden tank and uh, for him wooden cage and it had a metal screen on the top about that big around that was all nailed down and uh, it was for me to put their heat lamp on but she started punching at that screen and she meant she was so strong she punched her way right out like punched that screen out and I tried everything. I nailed that thing like you wouldn't believe. I tried everything. And uh, nail guns, hammer nails, um, securing it to the sides. And she just, once she punched out, she knew that she could do it. And I couldn't keep her in there um, all the time. And uh, she would get out, crawl over the tops of my cabinets. Um, one time I remember I'm sitting at my desk and she crawled over the cabinet behind my desk, you know, that big shelf. And I hear this, <laughs> and I'm like, what is that? Because I was grading. So I was in there alone and it was quiet. And all I heard was this, <laughs> talk about a stalker. I looked up and her head was coming down that cabinet behind me. And I was like, ah, pretty scary. I mean, um, um, Custodians sometimes would find her out uh, across books on the cabinet shelf and everything. Everybody got in a habit where they, they came into my room, they went and checked her tank. And if she was not in the tank, you just exited the room and shut the door and they let me deal with her. So um, they get really big. I mean, I kept safety gear in my room and um, not allowed to have knives, of course, um, but I did keep a big saw. So in case anything did happen i could have some kind of defense uh, fire extinguisher um pretty dramatic um safety measures and it just became where i was kind of like you know so i found a really good home for her and uh moved on but a lot of people don't do that a lot of people can't find a good home for their snake or anybody to take it in and so they release it out in the wild. And right now in the Everglades, they're having a huge problem with these pythons because they are invasive. They are eating food sources for those native um, animals. And as a result, they are growing huge and the native organisms are having a problem with their population sizes. And so the absence of natural enemies oftentimes also will cause these population explosions of these invasive species because they've never been in that environment before and there's nothing that's gonna eat them. There's nothing that's going to destroy them. Um, this is a uh, type of mussel. Some of you might have gone like up to Silverwood Lake 
and or some other lake and you'll see signs as you go in especially if you take a boat it'll tell you that you have to have your boat inspected and at silverwood lake for example they're looking for specific species of mussels um, in your bilges or on your um, side of your boat because if you were to bring those in, they reproduce very, very quickly and they destroy all the native um, plants and fishes that are in that particular lake. And uh, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get rid of them. There was a, a lake up in Northern California, I want to say Tahoe area, that got these invasive mussels in their lake. And the only way they could get rid of them is they actually had to uh, poison the lake they killed everything in the lake, all the fish, all the algae, everything in there to get rid of these mussels. And then what they had to do was plant back native species to uh, reestablish themselves in that lake. Um, really, that's, that's tough management. So don't take your pets or your non-native species and release them out into the wild, okay? Okay, so let's talk about e ecosystem structure and the dynamics of those ecosystems. The ecosystems is our next level in levels of organization. All the organisms that are in that community and their interactions with the abiotic factors in that environment are going to be making up um, what we refer to as the ecosystem. So remember in an ecosystem, the energy flow is from the sun, through those components in the ecosystem, which are the primary consumer, I mean, the producers, the primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers. And then we have those detritivores, those fungi that are absorbing their nutrients. And we have the decomposers, the prokaryotes, um, and um, other fungi that are breaking down and destroying that dead organic material. And so we end up also with the help of those decomposers, that chemical cycling of materials, um, that carbon, the oxygen, the hydrogen, and the nitrogen in those ecosystems. So we end up with this chemical cycling of these components, which help provide us with those carbohydrates, fats, nucleic acids, um, and to say carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids that we need to um, run our metabolism. So, oops, make myself dizzy here. All right, so primary productivity is basically the conversion of solar energy into chemical energy through photosynthesis. And this primary productivity is basically what's making the leaves, the fruit or the vegetables that, uh, and think of a fruit or a vegetable as an energy storage place. So it's storing energy for the plant, but then we know that it produces more energy than that plant needs. And so we can eat that fruit and that veggie, those leaves, et cetera, and we can get energy from the plants as well. So the total amount of, of, plant that is made during a given time period is referred to as gross primary productivity. And the producers, again, are going to use some of that organic material that they produce for their own metabolic processes like cellular respiration. What's left over, whatever it is that the plant doesn't use, is referred to as net primary productivity. So if we think of this as a paycheck, you get your entire paycheck, that's your gross but you gotta pay some of that to the IRS. What's left over is what you actually get to use and that's your net, okay? So what we get to use is the net or the net primary productivity is what's left over after I drive all my metabolic processes. And that is what's available to us as food as well. Okay, so the net primary productivity that occurs in various ecosystems is listed here. And we can see that the, the biggest um, area with the highest amount of primary productivity is in algae beds, which makes sense because algae, um, well, unfortunately we didn't really cover algae this term, but algae, um, they're living in the water. They, um, they're, they're, leaves are actually called blades 
and they're exposed directly to the water. So they're able to filter and get the nutrients that they need directly from the water. And then algae has these special gas bubbles that helps to raise those leaves up towards the top of the water column so that they are closer to sunlight or the top of the water column where sunlight can penetrate the water column and they can undergo uh, photosynthesis. The second one is the tropical rainforest where we know there's lots of water available, then there's lots of sunlight available all year long. And we know like the tundra, um, they don't get a lot of precipitation and their soil is frozen. So we would expect there wasn't be much uh, primary productivity there. All right, so this here that we're looking at is what's referred to as an energy pyramid. And it shows the flow of energy from the producers to the primary consumers, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers. And it shows that, in this case, that 10% of the energy that is available at one energy level, only 10% of that energy is passed on to the next level. And this is what we refer to as the 10% law. So for example, if the sun was producing um, 1 million kilocalories of sunlight, then the plant as it's absorbing that sunlight for photosynthesis is only producing 10,000 kilocalories of energy. And that means that only 10% of that energy that was produced by the plants from the sunlight is going to be available to the primary uh, consumers. So in turn, the primary consumers are only going to be able to take in a thousand kilocalories or, or, or use a thousand kilocalories, which means only 10% of that is going to be available to the next level and so on. So in this diagram here, we're looking at the fate of energy in a leaf that's being consumed by a caterpillar. Now this leaf is only going to be able to pass on 10% of its energy to this caterpillar. What happens to the other 90%? Well, let's look here. 90% of that energy is going to be lost, 50% or I'm sorry, 50 kilocalories of that is going to be lost as waste material, um, which includes heat energy. Um, we know that fecal matter um, is warm when it's released, urine is warm, um, your skin is warm, that is heat energy that's released as a result of metabolic processes that are occurring in this leaf. Um, which includes 35 kilocalories that are going to cellular respiration in the plant. And then 15 kilocalories of that energy that they have stored is used for new growth, um, increasing the biomass or the amount of leaf material that that plant can produce um, as part of its primary productivity. So there's 90 kilocalories of energy stored by the plant that's going to be used by the plant, okay? 10% is what's available to that caterpillar as it is eating that leaf, and that's it. So those organisms that are found at the secondary and the tertiary level are oftentimes referred to as omnivores because many of them will eat not only the carnivores that are below them, but they may eat the herbivores and they may eat the plants. So when humans eat grain or uh, fruit, we are eating the primary consumers and we are referred to as primary consumers at that point. I'm sorry, we're eating the producers and we are referred to as primary consumers. If we are eating the carnivores, we're eating beef or we're eating meat from the herbivores, we are referred to as secondary consumers. If we are eating those larger organisms that are eating the herbivores, um, we are referred to as tertiary consumers. Um, and another example is a field of corn can support many more human vegetarians than meat eaters. And that's because think about that pyramid again, think about the biomass, where are most of the organisms located? They're located at the producer level. There are way more producers than there are uh, primary consumers. So those primary consumers are going to support a smaller population of organisms at the tertiary and the quaternary levels, which is why there's very few quaternary um, consumers. And this is just looking at the, another diagram of that pyramid um, and those trophic levels. Here's humans as primary consumers 
Here's humans as secondary consumers. So ecosystems are supplied with a continual influx of energy from the sun. Again, remember the sun is the ultimate source of energy. Except for meteorites, there are no extra extraterrestrial sources of chemical ele elements. We are totally dependent upon what is here on earth and the recycling of those chemicals that we and other organisms are using. Those chemicals have to be recycled or we are not going to be able to sustain life, which is why sustainability is so important. And these are referred to as biochemical cycles. Um, they include the biotic components in the environment. They include the abiotic components in the environment. We have abiotic reservoirs. These are reservoirs in our environment where chemicals are going to accumulate or be stockpiled outside of living organisms. So for example, um, an abiotic reservoir for carbon dioxide is the atmosphere. Um, the abiotic reservoir for water is our oceans, okay? So what, So there's four main cycles. Uh, the first one is the carbon cycle. Carbon cycle is the major ingredient of all organic molecules. You already know carbon, I'm sorry, carbon hydrates, uh, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, their main building block is carbon, which is why they were referred to as an organic molecule. The carbon is found in the atmosphere so its abiotic reservoir is the atmosphere and that carbon cycles globally. Uh, it resides in plants and animals in their biomass. So in our tissues and our cells, it resides in fossil fuels. It's in soils. It's in sedimentary rocks. Remember, we can carbon date rocks to determine how old they are because of the carbon that's in there. And we can find it in the ocean at, or water sources as dissolved carbon or dissolved carbon dioxide. So here we are looking at the uh, carbon cycle. So for example, um, trees are very important. If you think about uh, when you drive down the freeway, you oftentimes maybe um, think, oh, those plants are so pretty along the freeway. It's so nice that they're planting plants along the freeway. Why do we have plants along the freeway? Well, cars produce carbon monoxide. And we also have carbon dioxide production that is increased wherever there's a large population of people. So remember plants during photosynthesis, what is one of their reactants? Their reactants is carbon dioxide. So these plants remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they produce carbohydrates through carbon fixation. Then the, the, the fruits, the veggies, the trees, I mean, whatever these plants are producing is available to the primary consumers. And then of course, the secondary consumers can eat the primary consumers that ate the producers and so on. All three or four of these groups of organisms in these trophic levels undergo cellular respiration. Remember, that's the main characteristic of life. Every living thing undergoes cellular respiration. Cellular respiration, does what? It takes in oxygen and it produces carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide is released back into the atmosphere so that this cycle continues. Now, um, these organisms are all going, leaves are going to die and fall to the ground. Animals are going to die and they're going to poop and they're going to produce waste material. And the detritophores are going to absorb some of those nutrients and grow and develop. Others of those are going to be the decomposers and they're going to break down that organic material into carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, which is uh, through decomposition, which now provides the basic building blocks for these plants think of it as like fertilizer along with phosphate and sulfur and uh, again the cycle repeats itself we can also take some of the um, the wood that's um, from these plants we can take fossil fuels some of those diatoms and stuff we can burn these fossil fuels that's also going to release carbon dioxide back into the environment and this cycle is just going to keep repeating Okay, so the next cycle is the phosphorus cycle. The phosphorus cycle, all organisms require phosphorus. Remember, phosphorus is important for making what? Proteins, nucleic acids, ATP. 
Um, it's the main mineral component that makes up your teeth and your bones. Without it, you would not have strong teeth or strong bones. Uh, phosphorus is not found in the atmosphere. It is only found in the lithosphere, the earth, okay? Uh, phosphorus depends upon the weathering of rocks. So it's bound up in rocks because phosphates are transferred from terrestrial to aquatic ecosystems through uh, the breaking down of those rocks. Um, these ecosystems much more, the aquatic ecosystem, I should say, those ecosystems are going to get more phosphorus uh, much quicker than terrestrial ecosystems. It, if you wait for a rock to break down and release its phosphorus outside your door, you're going to be waiting for a long time um, because it requires water. It requires um, a movement. It requires, um, you know, abrasion to occur to break down those rocks. The amount um, of phosphate then in terrestrial ecosystem will gradually decrease over time. And that's why we do things like fertilize our plants um, with some phosphates to provide them with the phosphates they need to undergo their metabolic processes. So here's looking at um, a phosphorus system. Now think about this, the reservoir for phosphates then is in rocks. That's where we're going to find the majority of phosphates. And here we have the weathering of rocks, which is the breaking down of rocks due to wind, rain, pressure, et cetera, um, which will release the phosphates that are stored in that reservoir, um, releasing it into the water. When water, when there's a lot of rain over extended periods of time, you'll oftentimes find shortly thereafter that there's these blooms that occur in these water sources where you have this algae bloom. And that's oftentimes because there's excessive phosphates in the water, which means there's excessive nutrients and these um, algae and, and uh, water plants just grow like crazy. But at the same time, what happens is they starve the water of the oxygen that uh, the fish need, for example, and so you'll see a, a huge fish die off as well. They'll all be floating on the surface. All right, so our next one is the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen, of course, is also an important ingredient of proteins and nucleic acids. It's essential for the structure and the functioning in all organisms. You can't live without protein, okay? And you need your genetic material to um, make you who you are, right? So nitrogen is oftentimes a limiting uh, plant nutrient. Your plants depend upon nitrogen. If they're not getting nitrogen, uh, oftentimes one of the first signs of them not getting nitrogen is the leaves will turn yellow and it's not a result of it being fall. It's literally your plant is missing a major nutrient. So you need to go get some fertilizer and fertilize your plant. Um, the nitrogen cycle depends upon microorganisms like bacteria for a process called nitrogen fixation. Uh, remember, when we talk about fixation, all we're talking about is the bonding of one chemical to something else. And in this case, what's happening is we're converting the gaseous nitrogen that's found in the atmosphere into compounds that the plant is able to use, such as ammonia and nitrates. And so nitrogen actually has two abiotic reservoirs in which nitrogen is stored. The first one is in the atmosphere. In fact, when you are breathing and we talk about air, um, a lot of people go, oh, I'm breathing in oxygen. Oxygen, actually oxygen is um, limited compared to nitrogen. You are breathing in way more nitrogen than you are oxygen. Um, about 80% of the nitrogen in the air, I'm sorry, the air is made up of nitrogen. Um, soil is the second abiotic reservoir because that's where these plants are going to be getting their nutrients or their nitrogen from. So this is just looking at a brief um, nitrogen cycle here where we have this nitrogen fixing bacteria, which are um, undergoing nitrogen fixation. So they're producing those nitrogen sources, that ammonia, the nitrates that are necessary for this plant to grow and reproduce. These nitrogen fixing bacteria are found in the soil. And um, keep in mind, plants, animals, and everything, they are dying, they are pooping, they are producing organic material, which these detritus and decomposers are breaking down, 
producing ammonia that's again being um, broken down by these bacteria and making it available as a nutrient to the plants. Um, these plants will as, um, assimilate those and uh, produce the proteins and nitrogens that these plants need and uh, then release that nitrogen back into the air with the help of these denitrifiers. Because think about these denitrifiers as they're breaking it down, they are also producing nitrogen gas. All right, so here is an algae bloom here. Isn't that disgusting? <laughs> Um, in aquatic ecosystems, primary productivity is limited by low levels of phosphorus and nitrogen. So when you end up with a runoff of nitrogens and phosphates into the water, either by um, rain or maybe a farmer is overwatering, um, you, or maybe um, you're actually depleting the amount of water that's available in that reservoir, and as a result, you, as water is evaporating out, you may end up with a smaller um, quantity of water, which increases the number of nitrates and phosphates in that water, and you could end up with an algae bloom. All right, so humans rely upon natural ecosystems to supply fresh water and foods um, for the recycling of nutrients. Uh, to decompose waste material so that those nutrients can be recycled back into our um, ecosystems and to regulate climate climate and air quality as well so wetlands again these are um, remember these are areas in which the terrestrial uh, habitats interact with the um, water biomes and they help to buffer coastal populations against tidal waves and hurricanes and help to preserve those communities in those areas. Natural vegetation helps to retain fertile soil. It helps to prevent landslides and mudslides. We know that when we have a huge fire, um, that we are worried the next winter or two that we're going to have these huge mudslides because we have no natural vegetation that are helping to um, hold that soil in place. These pictures here happen to be um, from the um, <sighs> the sand bowl. That's not the name of it. Uh, it's a period of time in history in which we destroyed all the topsoil in the um, south midwest, south southeast um, portion of the United States, and as a result, a dust bowl. It resulted in uh, the topsoil blowing away and creating these huge dust bowls or uh, sandstorms that actually buried entire villages, entire houses underneath this sand and dirt. And people actually had to move out of the area because all of the fertile soil was destroyed. And we learned a lot from that. Um, and it took a long time for that topsoil to replenish itself with nutrients in order to be able to put any kind of crops back in that area. So people had, this is when people moved in wagons out here to the West because their entire uh, being depended on, on it because they couldn't raise food in these areas anymore. All right, ecosystems that we create are also essential to our well being. Um, uh, we see this was um, in Dubai. They built a whole building in which they created these gardens and uh, trying to clear, um, first of all, pollutants out of the air, but they could also create crops that produce food for people. Um, agricultural methods introduced over the past decades have really pushed croplands beyond their natural capacity uh, to produce food. Um, we even end up with aquacultural uh, farms in which we can farm various plants like algae that are used in food preservatives. We can um, farm fish, uh, clams, and other food sources as well. So that sustainability portion is really, really important. And sustainability has the goal of developing, managing, and conserving Earth's resources. In other words, paying attention to that ecological footprint and making sure that we meet the needs of people today without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. 
Again, uh, I want you to take a look at that movie, Serengeti Rules. It's not required, but it is a really good film. It's an hour long, and um, I think you'll really, really get a lot out of it, especially in terms of keystone species, their importance, as well as many of these ecological principles that we've been talking about. Okay, so you should be able to define a biological community, explain why the study of a community ecology is very important. You should be able to tell me about interspecific competition between species um, that are the same. You should be able to tell me about mutualism, predation, herbivory, parasitism, give me examples of that. You should be able to tell me what a niche is, um, how competition can occur between niches, be able to tell me about various relationships, um, explain some of the protective mechanisms that ha plants have, for example, to protect themselves from predators, what coevolution is, um, be able to tell me what a food web, a food chain is, trophic levels, energy pyramid, um, how they interconnect with one another, the energy flow in a food web or food chain, um, species that, uh, what components um, improve species diversity, why species diversity is important, um, explain how disturbances can affect communities, explain what an invasive species is and how it can affect communities, compare primary productivity, um, describe the movement of energy through food chains, um, be able to uh, describe the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, as well as the water cycle, um, know what eutrophication is um, and how it can affect, um, um, for example, the decrease in nutrients like nitrates and phosphates and decrease species diversity as well as oxygen levels and explain how human activities like deforestation, um, invasive species, uh, destroying keystone species, et cetera, uh, threaten natural ecosystems, all right? So uh, that's it for our ecology. That is also your last lecture for the term. Uh, you guys did very well. I'm very impressed. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please contact me and I will talk to you later.